So that's just to, to summarize that, you know, again, when you're coming to this question of what algorithm am I going to use, well, you need to think about the data that's available. Do I have reliable presence absence data? Can I really think that my absence records are reliable in this context? And we talked an awful, um, you know, a, a lot yesterday about this issue of reliability of, of absence records. Do I really only, sorry, do I really only have, let me go back, presence data, or should I be using one of these approaches that, that takes background in, in, into account, either through pseudo-absences or, or through true, true background way of thinking, okay? And, and one reason that you might choose a, a presence-only approach over a presence-background approach um, would be if you don't really, for example, you know, in the context of, of, of the, 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 the last talk that Town gave, if you don't have a good estimate of what your um, study region should be, what your dispersal capacity or what M should be. In that case, you might really choose an approach that is truly presence only. We're going to get into to more detail on that. I'm just trying to introduce these different ways or, or different different categories of models that, and, and how they use the data. A second, a second kind of very general consideration that we need to be thinking about when, when selecting and, and, and calibrating models. Here's, a, 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 I think, a, a neat way of looking at this problem, um, but bear with me, it, it takes you... It's kind of conceptual to start with, it's a very cool way that um, Miguel Nakamura, a colleague of ours, has, has, has presented in, in the past. Let's suppose that we have some, um, some relationship between, between two things. So this can be extremely generic, but in our context, this is probably going to be the probability of the species occurring against some environmental variable, say temperature. Okay? But let's think about this generically. This is a relationship between two, two variables. And this is the truth. Okay? That is actually in nature what that relationship looks like. And I'll mention in a minute that that might be not a good example. Of, you know, this might be a little bit of a complex relationship that, that might not really be the case in nature, but, but that's our truth. Okay, so what do we do? We go out and we take what we refer to as a, as a training or a calibration sample. These are those points, you know, we go out in the field, we find our occurrences of the species, and they tell us something about that relationship between the kind of probability of finding the species and um, some environment, temperature or precipitation. So these are our, our training points, okay? And what we're going to do is we're going to build a model. We're going to build some simple model that, set, uh, that, that estimates what that relationship is between these two factors. So um, between X and Y, if you think about it just very conceptually. So this might be just some very simple linear model that kind of makes sense looking at it, um, that, that, that we're fitting through those points. Okay, then what do we do? We go back out into the field and we take some test points. Okay? So we go back out and we take some more records from, 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 from nature, from, from, the, from the truth. In practice, in what we've, we've been covering this week, we might just divide our original, say, 100 localities or 10 localities or 20, however many we've got, into some points that we're going to use to build the model, to, to fit the model, and some that we're going to use to test the model. But what we have are these test points and these training points, okay? all of which are taken from the truth. So, what we can then do is calibrate or, or we can take some sort of training error. We can say, well, how well does our model fit the points that we used to build the model? Okay? And that's just represented by these blue lines here. Of course, the difference between what the training point was and what the model said was, you know, this is some sort of kind of error here. Then we can go out and we can do the same test points. And we can say, what's our error on the test points? And when we get into model evaluation, that's our key statistic, is how well can these test points that weren't used to fit the model, remember our model, this simple line here, was not built using these red test points, it was using the blue test points. So our, our, our real valuable measure of predictive performance are these little orange bars here, the error between the test points that weren't used to build the model, or train the model, and, 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 and the actual, um, uh, the, the, the truth in nature. Okay, so, so, so that's, that's one example. Let's contrast that. Let's take the same truth, 
Let's take exactly the same training sample. These are our points from nature. These are, in our case, our current records. And let's fit a much more complex model. Okay? So let's fit some sort of model that can fit more, response, uh, more complex responses. Looks nice, right, in some, in some respects. Remember, we don't really know the truth here. All that we know are our observed occurrence records. Um, and we fit a model that kind of nicely fits through them. Again, we go out and take the same test points. So we're going to use exactly the same test points. And we can take our training error. Well, our training error is extremely small, right? Because we fit this really complex, really cool model that fit straight through our points, looked great. But then the error on the test points, these model, these um, localities that the, that the model didn't see, didn't see, is much, much higher than with the more simple model that didn't fit the point so well, but gave a more realistic um, impression of what nature was really like. Okay? And this is getting at this point of overfitting, and this is a real risk and a real serious issue um, with this field at the moment, in, in particular at the moment, because as the modeling algorithms kind of get more impressive, get more complex, they're able to fit these much more complex response curves, we refer to them, these responses between environmental variables and the probability of other species occurring, we have this real issue of the potential to fit to the training points extremely closely, but then lose predictive ability because we have overfit to the training points. And here's, a, here's another slightly less conceptual way of looking at it. This is our environment, just look at this, this part A here, this is our environmental variable. Again, this might be temperature, precipitation, uh, water holding capacity in the soil, uh, salinity in the ocean, whatever. Um, and this is our probability that the species occurs. Now, the blue line here conceptually is kind of really, I think, nice representation of what might be the case in nature. Got a high probability of occurring at some intermediate value, and then that drops off nicely um, uh, at each at each end. This red line here might be a classic example of a model that it kind of overfits to this response curve. Okay, so if our training points just fit on this red line, we might be able to fit a curve that really fits through the training points, but it's overfit to this model. Okay. Now, by contrast, we might have a model that underfits, and this would be the case um, with a very simple biochem model. Um, if we simply, and, and this will make a little bit more sense when Enrique's talk through what biochem is, but essentially all we're going to do in this case, suppose we just say, well, let's say that the, 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 the lowest value that's associated with an occurrence record, we'll say, is you know, at, at 10 degrees, and the highest value is at, say, 30 degrees or at 20 degrees, and then we'll just say that the probability of occurring within that range is, you know, extremely high. And outside that range is extremely low. So it's a kind of, you might refer to it as a box model, because we're not really fitting a response curve, but it's just saying, well, within these bounds of where we've observed the species, we're going to say that the species could occur. So there's a high probability, and outside there's a low probability. And we're going to say that's kind of underfitting to this true response curve. Okay, so that's the more conceptual way of looking at it. Let's now plot exactly that information in, um, in niche space. So again, this is now looking in two dimensions. This might be temperature versus precipitation, for example, or um, any other number of, of, of dimensions of the niche. Okay, so these black records are our true occurrence records that we use to build the model. Remember, we, we actually on the diagrams yesterday, there were little crosses. These are just our known occurrence records. The blue here then is actually the kind of abiotically suitable area. This is actually what we're saying is, in reality, the, um, the niche of the species. Now, a model that was overfit in niche space is going to look something like this. Okay? It's going to, because of the complexity of this response curve, it's going to fit very neatly and closely around these occurrence points. You might just have this one point here that we're fitting the model around. By contrast, this kind of um, very simple climate envelope, kind of box model, is simply going to say, well, within these bounds, we're going to say, you know, as I said, like 10 to 20 degrees, or maybe from x millimeters of precipitation to y meters of precipitation, we're going to kind of draw a box around that and say, well, it could be present anywhere within that area. 
that might be kind of underfitting. It's, it's predicting a broader area than um, or, or within niche space than, than, than the kind of true um, niche that, that we're saying is, is represented by this blue area. Then let's put that into geographical space and what we might be, you know, if we visualize the same, again, the true distribution and this hand maps on kind of leading to the kind of diagrams that I was showing yesterday conceptually. Um, you know, suppose we have this kind of abiotically suitable area here and a couple of patches out here. Well, the overfit model is going to just predict, um, it's going to pick out just these very few areas, smaller areas that fit neatly around the training points. But if we took some um, test re records from these areas that might also be um, habited, be inhabited because they are abiotically suitable, then this overfit model is not going to predict those. By contrast, this kind of simple box model might predict a much broader area. Okay, so more overfit models are going to fit a, a, a broader area. Kind of more complex models that fit more um, complex niches are going to fit, fit um, uh, predict a smaller area. And as the, the model becomes less complex and less overfit, then you're going to predict a broader area. And what we're faced with, and this comes back to the kind of challenges of um, model evaluation that we'll talk about tomorrow, is trying to get this balance right between the over and under predicting so that we get a realistic estimate of what the true niche or the true distribution of the species is. And we're going to talk a lot about that. It comes back to how we calibrate the models, how we evaluate the models to get this right balance. Um, between over and, and under predicting or over fitting to our occurrence data or unfitting to our occurrence data. Okay? Labor the point a bit because it's a really, really crucial one, particularly at this time, as I say, when we have algorithms that essentially, if you apply them blindly and don't, don't parameterize them carefully, it's extremely easy to overfit because they're so powerful. They can fit such complex response curves like this. And the cool thing is that in approaches like MaxN or in um, the R implementation of, of some of these methods like booster regression trees, you can actually look at these plots. You can see how your model is fitting against certain environmental variables. So you can see how fit the model is whether, and, and, and kind of visualize whether it might be overfit. All right, so that was just a couple of kind of general, um, general considerations about model selection. The final thing that I wanted to just um, touch on was, is it really important which, which algorithm I choose? Okay, we've emphasized that they're all trying to do the same thing, but does it really matter if I choose a Biocon model or a MaxN model or a neural network or a GARP or whatever? Um, I'm going to give you an example that kind of illustrates that, yes, it can make a huge difference. It's a bit of a, I think we're finding it's a bit of a worst case scenario, and I've picked out a couple of species that really emphasize this. So, I don't need to scale with this, but the point is that the models can make a big difference in the predictions. This was some work that we did, it, it, it's published, there's a couple of papers that cover similar ground, um, and, and the, the, the references are, are, are at the end of the presentation. We took um, a, a few species of, of Proteaceae in South Africa, so these are the um, uh, plant uh, group that, that, that's um, uh, endemic to, to South Africa. We took a, a totally standardized data set, um, so we, we took exactly the same presence records, exactly the same uh, absence records, um, really cool data set, exactly the same environmental variables.